Air hunters spend their lives tracking down families of people who died without leaving a will. They hand over thousands of pounds to long-lost relatives who had no idea they were in line for a windfall. Could they be knocking at your door? On today's programme, the air hunters investigate the case of a man who was surrounded by friends. We all liked a good time. And it was just one of the lads when we all sang, he sang, and they all danced, he danced. But kept his family at a distance. I was upset to think that Ken had died and nobody told me. And could an elderly relative be at risk? The shocking tale of two shadowy figures responsible for crimes worth £2 million that rocked the world of air hunting. This kind of fraud is despicable. It's, it's stealing from the dead. Plus, we'll have details of the hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of unclaimed estates held by the Treasury. Could you be due some cash? 2 thirds of people in Britain have not got a will. If they die without making one and no relatives can be found, their money goes to the government. Last year, a staggering £18 million went into the pot. £12 million of that was never claimed. Around the UK, more than 30 probate research companies compete to find missing heirs and help them claim the cash. Fraser & Fraser is one of the largest probate research firms in the world. Partner Neil Fraser knows that there's no room for shortcuts in this business. You have to be a little bit of a perfectionist to make sure that uh, you have found all the beneficiaries. We have uh, explored every last avenue. Um, sometimes that attention to detail can be the difference between finding a beneficiary and the estate ending up in the Treasury solicitor's coffers. It's 7am on a Thursday morning. It's the day the Treasury published their list of unclaimed estates. Case manager David Pacifico has come across an estate he thinks could be of interest. This is a new case called Kenneth William Adams, who died in Birmingham only in June this year, so it's a recent death. Kenneth Adams lived in this semi-detached house in Birmingham, but his second home was his local. The landlady, Carol Ann Johnson, remembers him fondly. Ken's pint was a pint of mild. He used to come through the door and we used to have it pulling ready for him. This was his table he used to sit on. His pint had to be in the right position for his newspaper, open his newspaper and start picking his bets out. We just knew what he'd do. He'd just done the very same thing every single day um, and he used to have a giggle. And uh, we'd just miss because it's too quiet without his routine every day. He was lovely. We loved him to bits and miss him. And Kenneth had a large group of friends that always hung out together. When Kenny came out of the army in the late 50s, he met up with his old friends who he met before the army. But then when they all drifted, he left him on his own. So us being a gang and a lot older, he just drifted in with us and he stayed with us right up to the end, which was about 45 years. A smashing kid, quiet. He likes to do the things he liked to do. You couldn't tell him anything. He knew it in his own mind what he wanted to do. But he was a good lad. When you've been together 45 years, a long time. In all the time Dennis knew him, Kenneth never talked about his relations. He was on his own, and uh, he used to say, no, I've got nobody, nobody at all. Despite his close links to his mates, Kenneth left no will when he passed away, leaving an estate of an estimated £110,000. It's a big sum of money, the team will have to act fast if they're to solve the case ahead of competing air hunters. They've already sketched out some details. It looks like he might be an only child. We think his mother died in 1992 or 1901 in Birmingham, so it's all local, locally based. Using the records they have on file, the air hunters are trying to find Kenneth's parents. Research director Gareth Langford thinks he may have found Kenneth's mum, Matilda, on a census. We've got a Matilda Harriet born in 1901. Now, the only census we've found so far is of Harriet Neal, um, who's born sort of in the right area. But there's potentially another birth. So you sort of wonder if it's the right one, really. 
But in the meantime, we need to work the census we have found. But there's always that nagging doubt, is it the right one? The census is a national survey taken every 10 years. It takes the essential details of every person at every address in the UK. It's a valuable tool for the air hunters. Kenneth's mother's maiden name was Neil, which can be spelt several different ways. And that can be a problem, so Neil obviously with an E at the end or without, without an E. The researchers need the right spelling off Kenneth's birth certificate. The company employ a group of travelling air hunters based around the UK. They spend their days ready to sniff out clues and chase the facts that will lead them to the airs. Ex-policeman and travelling air hunter Paul Matthews has been Fraser's representative in Birmingham for the last eight years. He's been doing a spot of detective work and he's come up trumps. Hello, Dave Paul. Hi, Paul. Yeah, you haven't got the right family. Excellent. Right, let's start with the marriage of the parents. OK, here's William Harold Adams. Although Paul hasn't actually got a copy of the certificates yet, through careful research at his end, he's found some names to work with. I'll catch up with you a bit later. Yeah, yeah, I'll be in the register office at nine o'clock when it opens, Dave, and then... Uh... I'll, I'll take it from there. Yeah, yeah. Cheers, Paul. OK, cheers. Right. That's a good start. Well, Paul's come through with some information about the deceased parents' marriage, the deceased mother's birth and the deceased birth. It all ties, with, it all ties up what we thought it could have been. All this information means the team can now put together a family tree, starting with Kenneth's parents. His father was William Adams. William was born in Swindon and he married Matilda Neal in Birmingham in 1929. When she had Kenneth, her one and only child, in 1938, Matilda was 37. This was quite unusual for the time, but it's not the only thing that stands out. The deceased Kenneth William Adams was actually born in the house that he died in, which is incredibly un unusual. Um, you know, he was born in 1938, and he's just absolutely gone nowhere. He died in the same house. As their research shows, Kenneth is an only child. The air hunters know they now need to look for cousins, as they are likely to be his closest living relatives. They really need more information from the certificates at the Birmingham Register Office. Travelling air hunter Paul is on the case. Hello, Paul. Well, I've got the, a little bit of a luxury that because the kids are off school, I've flown yeah. right the way through to the register office, so I'm sitting outside, kick, kicking my heels. Um, just see any more updates for us. We've got two deaths which I would like you to get. We've got George Frederick Adams. And there was also William had a sister, Rose Florence Adams. We've got a Jean... And Raymond G.H. Keeble, born March 1929, Birmingham. Thanks, Paul. Okay, I will Dave. speak to you when you can. OK, okay. cheers, Dave. Bye. 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 The office team are making progress mapping out Kenneth's father's family tree. Kenneth's granddad was Frederick Adams. He was a master painter and decorator. His skills were so in demand that he was one of the team that refurbished Queen Victoria's Royal Railway coach. Frederick married Florence in 1894, and the young couple went on to have nine children who were Kenneth's aunts and uncles. Case manager Simon Grosvenor is looking at the eldest, Edward Adams' death records. He died 4th of November 1918, I think in France. It could be Belgium. Um, which means he'd survived another seven days. He'd have made it through the war. He's quite lucky there. Born in 1896, Kenneth's uncle Frank would have been 18 when World War I began in 1914. After four years of service, he had risen to the rank of Lance Corporal, only to die just days before the end of the war. It's 10am, and Simon is now looking for Kenneth's auntie Rose, who had two children. Raymond and Jean are the children of the deceased aunt Rose Florence, who married a George Keeble in Birmingham in 1924. If either of them are still alive, the air hunters could have found their first heirs. Simon has been looking at the electoral roll. We found Raymond and his wife living in Solihull. Because if Raymond's still alive, he's a first cousin, so if anyone's going to know um, things about the family, it's going to be him. In the Birmingham Register office, Paul's up to his neck in certificates, so he's asked for some help. Yeah. Elsie May Neal. Yeah. Daughter of William Neal. Yeah. And Alice Neal, formerly Sheldon. Great, yeah. With Paul busy gathering evidence, the office have called in a second travelling air hunter, Dave Hadley, to track down possible beneficiaries. 
Right, well, I've just had a phone call from David Pacifico, and it looks like that he's got a uh, possible air to be contacted in Solihull, which is just outside Birmingham. I'm on the M1 at the moment, heading towards Luton, so it'll probably take me about an hour to get there, I would think. And he's going to ring me back once he's got some more details and a firm appointment. So, fingers crossed, um, I might get to see an air. But there's a lot at stake here. The team have thrown all that manpower into solving this £110,000 estate. It's vital that Dave finds the heirs ahead of the competition. Still to come, the sad truth of why the Adams estate ended up on the Treasury list. Ken, he, he was set in his ways and you couldn't tell him you've got to do a will because if you told Ken that, he wouldn't do it anyway. Hunting can often reveal surprising secrets, but when Fraser and Fraser began working the estate of Violet Young, they revealed a lot more than that. They helped uncover a multi-million pound crime that sent a seismic shock through the world of air hunting. This one event, or this series of events, has changed uh, probate research and genealogy and air hunting forever. This large but now derelict property in Ilford, Essex, was the home of Violet Young. Neighbour and fellow churchgoer Sheila Leake knew her well. She was very pleasant and um, she liked, you know, she liked, absolutely loved coming to the chapel and, uh, and being present there every month at the open days. When I took her home, um, mostly after the open days um, in the car, and um, delivered her to her door, and she would never allow anybody to come in the house. When Violet died in 2006, her house sat derelict and empty for months. With no known relatives, a neighbour decided to get in touch with Fraser and Fraser. Partner Andrew Fraser was cautious to begin with, as there was a possibility there could still be a will hidden somewhere. All of our contacts and, and research is about working out whether this is a, vi a viable case for us to take on or whether it's going to be a, an, e an economic loss for us. But Violet's estate promised to be large. The value of the house and the assets were in the region of £300,000. It's a huge sum, and when the nursing home where Violet died confirmed she hadn't left a will, the air hunters decided it was worth taking the case on. The case began like any other, with the team putting together a family tree in search of heirs. Senior researcher Gareth Langford was on the investigation. We basically we established where the birth was, uh, the birth of Violet Young, um, and then we looked for her parents, uh, which turned out to be, well, her father was George. So not only did we have the surname Young to contend with, we also had George, George Young. There's an awful lot of George Youngs out there. But eventually we found that the parents' marriage, and we discovered that Violet didn't have any brothers and sisters. So we are off to cousins straight away. Uh, and that's where things started to get a bit tricky. It looked like Violet's dad, George, came from a sprawling family. It turned out that he had seven brothers and sisters, so there were eight on the top line, including George. But then all of those people, all of his siblings, had sort of four or five or six children themselves, and all of those people had four or five, six children. So we started to get a very large tree together. And as the research went on, Gareth was overwhelmed by the sheer scale of the family tree. It really is huge. Um, I mean, this table's nowhere near big enough to um, look at the entire thing, but it goes on and on and on. And on. Faced with the daunting tree, Gareth and the team started at the top with Violet's grandparents and worked down. We were quite lucky with the uncles and aunts of the deceased. They were all born in the 1860s, 1870s, which made it quite easy for us to find them on the census, and that gave us an awful lot of information. But the more they uncovered, the further afield the family went. What became apparent was that the family were going to spread around the globe. Um, and we have heirs in uh, Australia, America, New Zealand, China, uh, South Africa. I and mean, they really went everywhere that uh, they could go. So um, that's when we started having problems, because obviously it's very difficult to track down people overseas. Luckily for Fraser's, however, a few heirs did remain in the UK. Violet's father, George, had a brother called Edward. His daughter, Marie Young, was Violet's first cousin. Tim Daniel is her grandson, and Violet's first cousin twice removed. Tim is a lawyer living in West London. The call from Fraser's came as a bolt out of the blue. It was a surprise. I mean, it was somebody whose existence uh, none of us had ever 
been aware of. Um, I mean, I've, I've spoken to quite a number of my cousins, and uh, none of them had, uh, had heard of her. Um, so I don't know. I mean, she must have lived, as far as we were concerned, quite a reclusive life. But uh, as it turns out, there are about 90 of us who were related to her, um, and um, uh, we're all uh, potential beneficiaries under her estate. The air hunters had invested thousands of pounds into solving the case of Violet Young. But a new piece of information was about to come to light that could shatter their work. Having undertaken a large amount of research and in the final preparations for a, le- a, a grant of letters of administration to be made, a further check of the probate registry revealed that a, a will had been filed. It was devastating news for the air hunters. The will left Violet's entire estate to a man by the name of Francis Fallon. Its existence meant Fraser and Fraser would earn nothing for all their hard work. In this case, the young case, you know, we'd worked so hard and, you know, had such a huge tree, to discover very late in the day that there was a will was, was you know, that was a, a real problem for us. It was also bad news for the many people who'd been told they were heirs to Violet's £300,000 estate. None of uh, my relatives uh, would obviously get anything. I wouldn't get anything. And all the work which uh, Fraser and Fraser had done in researching uh, uh, Violet and her background and who her relatives were would all just have uh, completely gone to waste. But there was something fishy about this new will. Violet's neighbour, Sheila, felt that its very existence was completely out of character for her friend. I felt that she wasn't too interested in what was going to happen because she was never interested in the house as such. Otherwise, I think she would have at least tried to maintain it. So she wasn't interested in in any sort of monetary things. Even more surprisingly, the beneficiary on the will, Francis Fallon, was not a member of Violet's family, and no-one knew who he was or how he was connected. We'd heard from family members that, you know, that the deceased didn't leave a will. Um, and also, I believe, uh, social services were involved, and they said they, there was no will. Um, so the alarm bell started to ring. So who was Francis Fallon? And why was he the beneficiary to Violet's £300,000 estate? The answer was a shocking revelation that would shake the world of air hunting to its foundations. For every air the air hunters find, there are still thousands that need to be tracked down. Right now, there are 3,000 estates on the Treasury's unsolved case list. Today, we've got two cases that so far have had the professionals stumped. Could your knowledge be the key to cracking the case? Ronald Hutt died in Ashford, London, on the 4th of May 2003. Did you know Ronald? Could you even be related to him and entitled to his cash? Arthur Kelso passed away on the 21st of November 1999 in Bebbington, Merseyside. So far, every attempt to find his rightful heir has failed. If no relatives can be found, his money will go to the government. But could it be meant for you? If you know the names Ronald Hart or Arthur Kelso, you could have a fortune coming your way. Still to come... Can air hunters solve the riddle of why Kenneth Adams, who grew up surrounded by family... It was a family that was very close, you know, they're living next door to each other, they would have known each other, they're all in, in their wills, they're all talking about each other. ...chose to lose touch with them. We used to go down to my grandmother's, who lived next door to them. But even then it was... there was a certain amount of a, aloofness uh, or shyness, I, I don't know which it was, with Ken. In 2005, Fraser and Fraser began work on the estate of Violet Young, who died alone in Ilford in Essex. She died with more than £300,000 in assets, but she hadn't left a will. She didn't ever speak about family, so I I, I really not quite sure what um, the situation was. In fact, I was very surprised to hear that she there were 90 members, not close members, of the family. Believing that Violet Young had died in test date, Fraser and Fraser invested thousands of pounds researching the family tree and tracked down an incredible 90 heirs. But just when they thought their work was done, a will appeared, rendering all of their work useless. The fact that a will had turned up meant 
that none of the heirs we had traced would be entitled to benefit from Mrs Young's estate. One of the heirs and the administrator of the estate is Tim Daniel. This was obviously something which was quite unknown, uh, obviously to Fraser and Fraser, um, or indeed to any of the rest of us. So it came as something of a surprise, not to say a bit of a shock, actually. All of Violet's estate had been left to a Francis Fallon, but there was no obvious link between Violet and this man. And when they discovered some discrepancies in the paperwork, it was enough to arouse suspicion. Andrew Fraser decided to consult a specialist, probate litigation expert Claire Ainley. The allegations were simply that the circumstances of the execution of this will all pointed to the fact that it wasn't um, a document that Violet Young had signed. At that point, it had become apparent that a grant of probate had been taken out in favour of a Mr Francis Fallon. Everyone I spoke to in the course of my evidence gathering um, who had known Violet Young had never heard of Mr Fallon at all. Um, she had one quite close friend who visited her both at the care home and subsequently in hospital, and he had never heard her speak of this person at all. Um, so I think, again, the fact that she had, um, well, on the face of it, made a will in favour of someone that nobody had heard of and left her entire estate to this person, again, it just heightened um, everyone's suspicion. Claire was convinced that something wasn't right, and the fact that Francis Fallon's solicitors had begun to liquidate Violet's estate and put her property on the market rang alarm bells. I wrote fairly hastily to the solicitor acting for Mr Fallon, um, explaining the circumstances, telling them of our suspicions, and that um, if steps weren't taken to halt the sale of the property, we would in all likelihood be instructed to go for an injunction. But Claire also knew she needed to take stronger measures. I decided it was time to get the police involved to see if they could step in and use their powers um, to um, seize the deeds to the property um, or threaten um, further action. The police needed to act fast before the house was sold and any other assets from Violet Young's estates were unlawfully taken. The property hadn't been sold but an attempt was being made to sell it and there was also money in the deceased bank account that had gone um, and I was informed that uh, Mr Fallon had taken the money out of the account. In fact, as well as getting the house put on the market, Francis Fallon had siphoned off a whopping £60,000. Mark Cross, a detective constable working for the Metropolitan Police Fraud Squad, was handling the case. Well, this kind of fraud is... Despicable. It's, it's stealing from the dead. But when Violet Young's case landed on his desk, DC Cross was in the middle of one of the largest ever probate fraud investigations. It was a crime worth £2 million, and the man at the centre of the investigation was one Francis Fallon. I was allocated this investigation in um, November of 2007, and it was a referral from the Land Registry. Um, the uh, defendant, Frank Fallon, had been uh, identified as carrying out numerous searches online in relation to certain properties. Fallon worked with an accomplice called Richard Carr. Fallon had been using the Treasury's list of unclaimed estates to find people who had passed away who had property. He then attempted to illegally transfer the properties into his own name. Potentially, Fallon and Carr could have made millions of pounds by selling properties that they were not entitled to. Um, they managed to register properties in alias names that they were using, and in some cases sell houses that they were not entitled to. And Violet Young's house was a prime target. She had not registered that property. She had been left that by her parents and she lived there alone. Upon being granted probate, Frank Fallon emptied the bank accounts of Violet Young. There was in the region of £60,000 in her bank accounts and he transferred that money to a bank account of his own and used the money as his own. DC Cross needed to prove that there had been foul play in the creation of Violet's will. His first stop was to call in a handwriting expert. I suspected that the signature of Violet Young was in fact a forgery because during my inquiries I recovered some signatures of Violet Young on documentation from the care home where she was living um, and certainly to the untrained eye the signatures did not match. Therefore I suspected that we were dealing with a forged will and I made further inquiries in relation to it. The Violet Young side of the investigation was, was very important to show that Frank Fallon was not afraid to submit documentation to the probate department. He purported to be the beneficiary of the will, 
was quite happy, even though the, war, the will was f forged, to put himself forward in his own name as the beneficiary and was not afraid to front out, if you like, um, the, the different organisations in this country. With strong positive evidence from the handwriting expert and plenty of circumstantial evidence, DC Cross's team were finally ready to bring in Fallon and Carr. In December 2008, we had collated enough evidence to uh, arrange the arrests of Frank Fallon and Richard Carr. The ruthless pair of modern-day grave robbers that had preyed on the estates of innocent people like Violet Young were charged and remanded in custody. Following the examination of Richard Carr's computer, we found a copy of one of the wills and assisted us in evidence in the forgery of that will. And also we found a deed of gift which related to Violet Young, which showed that the, the, the two were involved together in preparing documentation to try and prove that they were the beneficiaries of the estate of Violet Young. In November 2009, when the trial of Francis Fallon and Richard Carr begins, Along with the case of Violet Young, they are being charged with 11 other counts of probate fraud. Andrew Fraser is called as a key witness. I'm very nervous, actually. You know, we're talking about criminal matters, not no, 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 civil matters. You, you said this, I said that, and the court decides. This is a criminal prosecution. Francis Fallon, I understand, is on remand. He's been in Wanderers Prison for nearly a year now. And the outcome is that he's going, like, if he is found guilty, likely to be a custodial sentence. Having given evidence at the trial, Andrew is confident that justice was going to be done. I hoped, on the conclusion of this case, we had a right to all 90 heirs entitled to Violet Young's estate to tell them that Mr Fallon's been found guilty of forgery and as such his will, as proved, will be struck out. Three weeks later, the jury return their verdict and both Fallon and Carr are found guilty on all counts. Fallon is sentenced to seven years in prison whilst Carr, who has been convicted in his absence, remains on the run. It was a very satisfying result and uh, a lengthy prison sentence that was thoroughly justified for the offences that they were committing. Frank Fallon um, made half a million pounds himself and had he been successful in selling the properties that he transferred into identities that, that were not true, um, he could have sold the properties for several million pounds. We are now using the Proceeds of Crime Act to try and identify the assets of Frank Fallon and recover monies from him to enable us to compensate um, the victims of this crime. Fallon and Carr used a number of ways to identify potential victims, including the Treasury's list of unclaimed estates. As a result of their activities, the government decided to take steps to guard against this type of fraud in the future. In 2007, the Treasury stopped publishing the values on the list of unclaimed estates. Now the list only includes the name, place and date of death of the person who's died. It may protect against foul play in the future, but it also adds another layer of work for the air hunters. Now they start their research by trying to put a value on the estate before deciding whether a case is worth taking on or not. To lose the values of the estates dramatically changes how probate research or air hunting uh, works. In uh, 2007, we were doing two cases, maybe three cases a week. Uh, now in 2009, at the end of the, the legal case, we're doing 10 to 15, 20 cases some days. So uh, a huge amount of extra work, even if some of them we don't take through to, to, to the end, it, it certainly has increased our workload dramatically. Everyone is relieved that someone has actually been caught for this. And I think we were happy to know that the, we, we put a stop to it in the first place, uh, to stop to no future, uh, future frauds of, of this type could happen. But whilst Fallon has been brought to justice, it's vital that the air hunters keep vigilant. I fear that if this estate had not been referred to us by a member of the public, he could have, he could very well have got away with it. Um, really, because Fraser's got referred it early on in the uh, in the cycle, and before the fraud was completed, then that's why we've managed to, to put a stop to it, and why the police have been able to put a conviction together. Um, Another month, another two months, it would have been too late. And for the family and friends of Violet Young, Fallon's conviction is a triumph of justice. Some crimes are talked about as being victimless, but actually th this is a crime with victims because there are legitimate 
um, relations who should have inherited uh, the estate, um, who may not have known of the existence of the person, but you know, under the law they are entitled to be beneficiaries. Um, and basically, you know, they are being cheated out of their lawful inheritance um, uh, by criminal means. In November 2009, one estate listed by the Treasury solicitor without releasing the value was that of Kenneth Adams. Air hunters Fraser and Fraser have picked up the case and discovered that he owned his own house, estimated to be worth £110,000. The team have dispatched travelling air hunters in the hunt for Kenneth's rightful beneficiaries. But as far as Kenneth's friend knew, he had no family and kept his personal life private. There's one girl I think he had his eye on. But uh, they was always together. And then one day they just parted, they never spoke again. And I went up to the girl one day and I said, whatever happens to you and Ken? Why didn't, uh, you know, we all thought you was made for each other. She said, I asked him to check me out. He said no, and walked away, and that was it. He never spoke to her again. Kenneth may not have been romantically inclined, but the landlady at his local, Caroline Johnson, certainly had a soft spot for him. We miss Ken terrible. He, he's just one of our customers that, you know, he was that sort of lovely, bubbly man. He was lovely. You just wanted to cuddle him. That was Ken. At an estimated £110,000, this estate is likely to have lots of competition chasing heirs. David Pacifico has called Michelle, the daughter of Raymond Keeble, a potential heir. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye. Excellent. It's a very good call indeed. It sort of verified the family of which it looks as if there may only be three beneficiaries on this side of the family. One being an aunt of the deceased who's aged 103 in a nursing home, which is great news. And this lady's father's still alive and so is her aunt. She knew uh, a good deal of knowledge about her grandmother's brothers and sisters because she was so interested in her family tree. And, and um, this is why she was able to confirm to me about whether these great aunts and uncles were married or not. So she's actually mentioned every one of the ones that we had in our family tree, which ties up. Despite having had eight brothers and sisters, there are now only three living relatives on Kenneth's dad's side, and they are all heirs. Edith, who is Kenneth's auntie, and his cousins Raymond and Jean. Travelling air hunter Dave Hadley gets the call to go and sign Raymond. He's available to be seen any time, so I'm going to make my way straight there now, and then hopefully I'll also be able to arrange an appointment to see his sister, who is also an heir, at about four o'clock this afternoon when she gets home from work. In the office, Gareth is amazed that such a large family would have so few offspring. But there's something even more surprising. It was a family that was very close. You know, they're living next door to each other. They would have known each other. They're all in, in their wills. They're all talking about each other. But it sort of looks like the family have just sort of filtered down to, you know, the last surviving few who happen to have lost contact with each other. Um, so it looks, at some stage, they were a close family. But, you know, um, sands of time, it's it sort of uh, drifted apart a little bit. Dave Hadley is hoping to sign Raymond Keeble. He was 10 years older than his cousin Kenneth, and the news of his death has come as a shock. I was going to phone him the other week because uh, we spoke just before Christmas. Yeah. And uh, he seemed to be doing okay. Right. I'm surprised that nobody contacted you then. I mean, maybe they just didn't find I mean, your details. He got his friends, and I'm surprised that they hadn't my contact. Raymond has a picture of another heir, Kenneth's auntie Edith. That lady up there on the end is 103. Yeah, I understand <laughs> that there's still somebody <laughs> in the family of that and, age, uh, which is amazing, isn't it? Raymond has his own theories why the cousins weren't in close contact. Ken was never close to the family. He'd lost his parents some years ago. Uh, but he'd got friends. I saw more of him when he was little. Uh, together with my sister, uh, we used to go down to my grandmother's, my mother's mother, uh, who lived next door to them. But even then, it was there was a certain amount of a, aloofness uh, or shyness. I, I don't know which it was with Ken, uh, but he just seemed to keep himself to himself. Raymond asks Fraser's to help him submit his claim, and back in the register office, Paul's day is done. Ten maternal uncles and aunts on both sides. Of those, we've got only got five years, so it's a 
Big tree, but not many ears, so that's fantastic news for us. Meanwhile, travelling air hunter Dave has arrived at Kenneth's other cousin's house, Jean Waring. Hello, Mrs Waring. Hello there, David Hadley from Fraser and Fraser. How do you do? This is, this is the family tree here. So this is you and there's your brother. There's your mother, Rose. Rose, yes. And if we follow that line along, there's Kenneth and there's his father, William, yeah. and his was mother... William? Are we yeah. William Harold? Well, it's Harold. Kenneth, it's Kenneth... Yeah, his father was William Harold Adams. Oh, okay. But a lot of people used to use their middle names in those days, and, yeah. and I think most of your family did, because when I was yes, speaking to your brother, did. he said, oh, Frank, and I said, well, was it yeah, Edward Frank? Right. And so, Thank you. so they obviously used their middle names, but um, your mother would have been entitled to a share if she'd still been alive, but because your mother's passed away, then her share passes down to her children. Jean has found the news of Kenneth's death very unsettling. I was upset to think that Kenneth died and nobody told me. Ken was definitely a chap on his own. All I can remember is that he used to be quite happy going out with his two pals and they'd go around for a drink. And that's about all. Jean has also asked Fraser to help her submit her claim. It's mid-afternoon, and the air hunters have found all the heirs to Kenneth's estate. David Pacifico is pleased at how the investigation went. I'm very happy with the outcome of this case because it looks like we located all the heirs, um, and it's all sort of tied up nicely. The team contacted five heirs who will share the £110,000 between them. But Ken's case would never have gone to the Treasury if he had made a will. Ken, he, he was set in his ways and you couldn't tell him you've got to do a will because if you told Ken that, he wouldn't do it anyway. He was convinced that his best friend and, as far as he was concerned, next of kin, would get whatever he got. People in who he used to say, have you made a will? No. And he, he just didn't want to know. Don't know why. I don't know whether he thought, well, why should I pay for, some, for somebody else to have? I don't know. He just said, no, I ain't no bother. That was his fault stuff. He always used to say, well, you're my next kin, so I said, don't mean a thing, Ken. Ken may have died without his family's knowledge, but his friends made sure he had a good send off. Ken was cremated at Yardley Cemetery. Um, his mum and dad was also there, so it was the correct thing for Dennis to decide that um, he should go up there with his parents. Dennis was the one that sorted out the funeral itself. I volunteered to do the buffet because um, I didn't want him to go without a wake. And he was happy and content here, and we felt that the right thing to do was to give him a good, a good send-off. This is the only place he could really add his do afterwards, after the church, like. Of course, we came back here and it, well, actually, it was like meeting the old days because some of his friends, which we hadn't seen many, many years, had turned up. And uh, it was nice to see them. Most of it all got older. But so we had a laugh. Some of the things he, they knew about him, which we didn't know about him. It was great, yeah. Pitches had to end the way, dear. If you would like to find out more about how to build a family tree or write a will, go to bbc.co.uk. From John O'Groats to New Zealand, another family of Brits head down under next. <laughs>